Hello, how are you all doing this evening? I would like to thank each and every one of you for spending time with me this evening. That being said, this class today is going to go over pressure analysis of an internal combustion engine. To do these type of readings, we're going to use a pressure transducer. A pressure transducer is a device that converts energy from one form to another. We all know what a pressure transducer is because they're on cars. We have all kinds of sensors on a car that is converting some type of mechanical movement or pressure movement into an electrical output. This electrical output will be read by an oscilloscope and displayed in such a format that we can make diagnostic decisions using this. Pressure transducers will need something else to work. They're going to need a power and a ground. From this current path, the current will produce a product within the circuit that makes the pressure proportional to the output voltage associated with it. So when we put one of these pressure transducers in the engine, that pressure, whatever we're reading, whether it's the exhaust pressure, the induction pressure, crankcase pressure, or the in-cylinder pressure, will be scaled appropriately. That means that we'll be able to put this on a screen and be able to make some pretty astonishing um, diagnostics using this information. When we do these type of tests, we need to make sure that we don't skip tests. We do a full support line with these type of tools at ATS and a lot of times our customers call in and they've only done part of the testing and it makes it really difficult to have accurate diagnosis. So to have accurate diagnosis we really need to do a crank test. That is where we're going to turn the engine over for an extended period of cranking time where we've disabled the engine. During this cranking test, we don't want to open the throttle plate. We want it closed. So a lot of people want to open the throttle plate wide open because I can get a clear flood mode on a lot of different cars and that will disable it from starting. The problem with this is, is now I don't have the throttle plate to be closed adding a restriction base to the induction system. That means that it's going to be harder to see the pressure waveforms for a good analysis. So leave the throttle closed during these tests. The engine running idle, that means I'm going to start the test and I'm going to let it run and we're going to do a snap with a D-cell. These are the tests we'll be looking at this evening. I don't know how in depth or how much time I'm going to have to cover each one, but we will get an idea of what's going on with these. I want to put another warning. Each one of these tests has its own rules. So a cranking test and those rules won't say apply to a snap throttle test. And the idle won't apply to either and the D-cell is totally different as well. We will not have enough time to go over this in depth. I have several articles online. If you go to ATSNM.com and go to the tutorials, you can read some of these articles that I've written on this process. For this evening though, we will cover some of the rules. Be aware though, each state is in a different pressure condition within the internal combustion engine and thus will have different rules applied to it. Next, don't skip these steps. In other words, you may think that the, you have a low power and so you just want to do a quick test and you're going to check the cam timing. In order to do this correctly, you're going to need to do a cranking test, you're going to need an idle test, a snap with a D-cell. All of these will be important and during each one of these tests we will need three pressure transducers in the engine that we will overlay so we can make sense of this data. One will be in the cylinder, one will be in the induction system, one will be in the tailpipe. 
We also want the ignition signal from the coil that we have removed from the spark plug. If we have a DIS system, a waste spark, you need to make sure that both spark plugs are disconnected. In some systems you might have two plugs. If you take one out, you could still fire the fuel. This could damage the, the pressure transducer, which none of us want. So make sure that we have the system electronic spark disabled from the being able to spark the fuel in the cylinder. So that being said, the next thing is, is whatever we're going to do with the spark, we want it active, but make sure that the spark is grounded away from the pressure transducer. All of these pressure transducers have chips in them and these chips are very susceptible to high energy discharge and you can damage the pressure transducer if the spark was to jump to it. So always be very careful with where you're putting the secondary and how that secondary is grounded away from your pressure transducers. The compression hoses that you use will also be important. The valving system that goes in this end of the valve, as a general rule, there's a, a, a one-way check valve. That valve cannot be in these hoses in order to do the testing. So if you're using a regular style hose that would come with your compression gauge set, please take the valve out because if the valve is in there, it will not allow the air to freely flow in and out of the hose where we can see these quick pressure changes within the cylinder. All these pressure hoses are also made very differently. So they have different volumes and different thermal abilities. That means as we run these on the engine, they're going to get really hot. And as they expand, they can create problems where the hose is expanding and taking up volume and it can actually change some of your pressure readings. If you're using a technique to where you're going to put a pressure transducer in each bank, be very aware that whether you have two different hoses or the same type of hose, the hose can actually give me two varied readings from the hose stretching, the heat, the volume, the size. These will all have a very profound effect on the cylinder's compression. You might lose 5 to 20 pounds just by having the hose different. So if you think you have a problem, always swip, swap the hoses to make sure that it's not the hose that you're really seeing the pressure reading. Just be aware the hose can give you some problems. What we're going to want to do is we want to be able to start the engine and we want to allow it to idle. In this state, this will be an in-cylinder compression idle waveform. I want to stress what we will cover first is an idle waveform. An idle waveform is very different than a snap or a decel or a cranking compression and it will carry a different set of rules as we will see as we learn more about these waveforms. In this particular instance we want the throttle blade closed. In this case when the throttle is closed I am making a negative pressure as that piston moves down against the closed throttle plate it's going to make negative pressure or a vacuum source within the induction system and in the cylinder. When we start the car and we allow the car to run, we're going to see a pressure reading very similar to this. What this is going to be is the pressure is going to come up and come down and then the valve, the exhaust valve is going to come open and I'm going to come up to the exhaust plateau. The induction valve will open pulling it into a negative state of pressure. It will close and whatever volume is within that cylinder is going to be compressed and then this is top dead center or very close for our practical purposes. One thing that we always need to remember is this is close to top dead center but it may not be exact top dead center. We have latency in the pressure transducers that will give me some offset. At idle our RPM for two fire cycles is going to be about 150 milliseconds from fire cycle one complete um, fire cycle. That's two revolutions of the crank. 
At crank, we're going to be somewhere around 600 milliseconds. So we have way more time. When we get up towards 3,000 RPM, you're looking at 40 milliseconds of time. The faster the engine is going, the more inaccuracy you have with the sensor. Additionally, if you have low vacuum or low volumes in the cylinder, excuse me, not vacuum, but volumes, the volume will make this not top dead center, it will drift to the right, indicating that it may look retarded. So under D cell, I have really high vacuum in the intake, that means that I don't have very much volume within the cylinder. With these low volume states, the towers will drift to the right becoming very retarded. If I have a leak and the leak is bigger than 60 thousandths, that would be my hole diameter which would be leaking a, sli a, a slight to large amount of air out of the cylinder. This top dead center point will also drift to the right, therefore it's not going to be true top dead center. It will be something other than that. The less volume you have in the cylinder, the further you get a drift to the right. For all of our practical testing, we're going to say that this is true top dead center and we're going to assume that this is going to be true. Be very aware that under really uh, low volume fills of the cylinder, such as that of under D cell or that where the cylinder is leaking, it will no longer be a top dead center point, but will move depending on how much volume is out of the cylinder to look like it's a retarded type of a signal. It, anything that moves to the right of the screen on a scope, anything that moves to the right is retarded, R and R. If the signal moves to the right, it would show latency or it's late, it's retarded in its signal timing. This is what an idling waveform is going to look at. We will look very closely at this waveform through this uh, presentation. Now if I zoom in on that waveform, I'm going to have two peaks or one fire cycle, two rotations of the crank. Now a lot of scopes may not have the ability to mark these. So what we're going to need to be able to do is to use the cursors in order to get our markings so we can find our stroke locations. Put a cursor through the top dead center point to the top dead center point. Look at your time, your period of time. I have 167 milliseconds of time between peak to peak. Now is what I want to do is I want to multiply that by 0.25. That would make it 41.75. I want to multiply it by 0.5. That's 83.5. And I want to mark it by 0.75. That's 125.25. This would be quarter of it, half of it, three quarters of it. So let's look at how this might work. I'm going to take the cursor from the far peak and I'm going to move it in and I'm going to wait until I get my time period of 41 milliseconds. 42 milliseconds. So this is going to be top dead center. That would be one stroke going from top dead center to bottom dead center. Now this is where the piston is its furthest point away from the header, the bottom dead center point. Then is what we want to do is we want to multiply it by the 0.5. That gives me 83 milliseconds. Now I have a top dead center mark at the 360 point. I've made one crankshaft revolution. Then I would multiply it and I would get the 125 milliseconds which gives me the three quarter point and now I'm at bottom dead center again and then we would move over to top dead center. Now, as far as our scope goes and Pico goes, you can put a marker through each one. Once this happens on our scope and you push the mark camshaft, we will put a grid on. The grid, each one of these is 180, 360, 540, 720. These are 30, 60, 90. So the bottom is incremented within 30 and these are 180 each. Now what that would give me is 
Top dead, bottom dead, top dead, bottom dead, top dead. These are my stroke designations or the piston locations. This would be the power stroke, the exhaust stroke, the induction stroke, and the compression stroke. The power stroke we will, we will now refer as the power stroke is the decompression stroke. As the piston came up towards the head and it comes closer and closer to the head, the volume within the cylinder is being compressed. As it comes as close as it physically can come to the head, I will have my peak pressure or the top dead center position is, will be given of that head, of that, of that compression where between the head and the piston. Now, as the piston moves back away from the head on the next stroke, which we would refer to as the power stroke, we're really decompressing it. Since we've disabled the spark, we are not able to ignite the fuel and have the fuel expanding, putting pressure on the top of the piston. Now we compressed, now the piston is moving away without the fuel being fired. So this now is just in a decompression state. So I compressed it and I decompressed it. So this is really the compression stroke and the decompression stroke. Then the piston is at bottom dead center and it's going to start moving up to top dead center and this is my exhaust stroke where we will uh, accomplish scavenging or we will push out the combustion byproduct into the exhaust system. Now this is top dead center, the intake valve is going to open and as the piston comes from top dead center it's going to move down to bottom dead center producing an intake pole. Now we are going to come over and we're going to start to compress it. So we have our four cycles of the auto cycle engine. So we have intake, compression, power and exhaust. During the induction pull, the intake valve opens and this piston moves down. As the piston moves down, it increases the volume. As this volume increases within the cylinder, it becomes a negative pressure state within the cylinder. Atmosphere, being at a higher pressure, wants to inrush into the cylinder and as long as the valve is open, I have airflow coming into that cylinder. Now I close the valves and both valves are closed and the piston comes up compressing the gas state within that cylinder. This compression is referred to adiabatic compression. Adiabatic says that any energy that was put into the air is not put outside the air. In other words, this piston moves so fast and it compresses the gas state within the cylinder that the air molecule are hitting each other. As we compress, the air molecules bounce off of the piston with its kinetic energy coming up and they start hitting each other. When these air molecules start hitting each other, they start to vibrate. When they vibrate, this produces a thermal energy or heat is produced. The compression state therefore produces high heat within the air load, but the heat, the compression stroke happens so fast that the air is heated, but you didn't have time to lose the heat into the valves, the cylinder head, the cylinder wall, or the piston. That means adiabatic. The energy stayed in the air. So now I heated this air up, and when I heated it, the hydrocarbon base in a petrol engine is also excited and the hydrocarbons start to move around and now we start to vaporize the fuel. All fuel stocks have to be in a vapor format in order to burn. Liquids and solids don't burn. Now that I have this air mass and the fuel contained in this is a, a vapor state, I am going to have a spark plug. When I have the spark and I ionize the spark plug gap, the heat across the spark plug from the position of plasma, plasma is a superheated gas, takes the fuel stock past its auto ignition point. When it goes past its auto ignition point, it disassembles as far as hydrocarbons and the hydrogen attached to an oxygen and it's H2O, water, and then the C connects to an O2, CO2. 
And so I convert the chemical from a high energy state to one of a low energy state. And the energy that's released from the high energy produces the heat that pushes down against the piston, forcing the piston down. Once the piston reaches the bottom, or close to the bottom, the exhaust valve will open. Now the piston is going to come up and we're going to scavenge the cylinder. As the piston comes up, I put this in a higher state of pressure than what's on the outside and the piston coming up forces that uh, exhaust or the burned gases out into the exhaust. These are our four strokes. An in-cylinder idle waveform is such as this. So now we want to take a little bit better look at this and we want to see that as we come up on compression, we're coming up on compression, we come to A. A for all practical purposes as we've discussed is true top dead center. Now once I start the piston and the piston starts to decompress I have this tower. This will be referred to as our compression tower. Now when I come down to half mast that's for measure from here to here that's if I measure from the bottom of this waveform to the top of this and I divide this in half I want to come in at half mast and I want to measure from the top dead center position to the, where it crosses and I want to do that same thing on this tower these two towers should be within 20 degrees of each other if they become further than 20 degrees further than each other it's an indication that there's a mechanical leak or a mechanical failure of the motor. What this tower will start to look like is what I refer to as a leaning tower. One side will be much wider and the other side will be much narrower. Anytime we have leaning towers it indicates that I have a mechanical failure within the motor. Now once we come past and we come down to half mass B and M, this is the measurement, half mast to the top dead center position, I want these to be within 20 degrees of each other. Now the piston continues its descent within the cylinder and it continues down until I get to C. And C is the 90 degree point within this pocket. This is the exhaust pocket, this is the exhaust plateau, this is the intake pull that comes across, and then we go back up on the compression for the tower. Now when I come down and we open the valve at D, this is, I'm, the piston is descending, and if you see right here, I have a position that where it changed. If I drew a line here and I drew a line here, I see a point where it changed the direction. When it changes the direction, this is the point that the exhaust valve opening was. This exhaust valve opening, as a rule of thumb, is going to be 30 to 50 degrees before bottom dead center. On most engines, this is a pretty good target point. Now, we have this upward movement right here. Now we need to think about what happened here. The piston is still descending because if D, the exhaust valve opened, it's somewhere between 30 and 50 degrees, that piston is still in a downward movement, but I have an upward rising of pressure. So what happened here? We need to go over to the other side of this exhaust plateau in order to understand this. So first we're going to say at top dead center or before, slightly before, slightly after, the induction valve opened and the piston starts a downward movement, a descending position within that cylinder. That pulls a negative point of pressure within the cylinder. Now this is in a vacuum state and we come across and we close the induction valve. Now what state was the valve closed in. The valve had to have a negative pressure state or vacuum within the chamber. When I close the valve, now I've trapped the vacuum in that in that sealed system. Now if I contain that pressure, whatever area or volume is here is now pressurized. Now I pressurize that and I come back down here. When the piston hits the same position as it was over here, this was in a negative pressure state or a vacuum. 
That means that this pocket has to be in a vacuum as well. If it started in a vacuum, when the piston descends to the same position, it will be in a vacuum again. So this exhaust plateau is produced because I have a vacuum on this side and this side. If the intake or the I apologize, the in-cylinder pressure is in a negative state of pressure. When I open that valve up, I have a vacuum in the cylinder and I have atmospheric pressure at a higher pressure. Higher pressures having more force always go to a lower pressure having lower force. That means that that air in the atmosphere runs into the exhaust pipe filling the cylinder. As the cylinder is filled, I get this ramp that comes up here. Now this ramp is going to be really important as well as the point of D to find my cam timing. So if I open at D and then this atmospheric pressure has an inrush into the cylinder, I want E about halfway up the mast to somewhere up here in the top. So roughly this pink line, the bottom dead center mark, should be somewhere in this position and if it crosses this point it's a good indication that the cam timing is correct. F is where I come to my peak, where I come to my zero plane or my atmospheric pressure. Now when the exhaust valve is open, it is in fluid communications with the exhaust pipe. The exhaust pipe has other cylinders pushing pressure or pushes into this pipe. The diameter of the pipe, the length of the pipe, will set up a resident frequency depending on the RPM that's put into these pipes. This will be some of the resident frequency or the bounce that you're seeing. So don't get too worried about these up and down movements. As long as they all are similar from cylinder to cylinder or they become very high at some point but all of these will have ripples and we don't worry too much about that until they become a problem. Now the intake valve usually opens slightly before top dead center. That's going to be where this downward position comes this will come over and once this opens I'll have a downward going downward edge moving into a negative state of pressure. About halfway up this ramp, so if I measured the zero point to an average median in the, in the intake pole and I went halfway up, that would be H. If I have a non-VVT cam, I want the halfway mark to be 20 degrees after top dead center. With VVT, then I want it to be about 30 degrees for top dead center, if the intake cam has the cam timing or cam phasing. Now, as I come across here, I'll see a lot of times where I have a, a real deep pull right at the beginning. That would be I. Now I needs to match D. D needs to be equal to I or slightly higher within two pounds. If D is higher within two pounds it's okay. What this difference comes from is the difference in valve opening due to the cam and the cam lobes. That's what's going to give me this difference. If I'm higher than two PSI you have some type of leak or cam timing issue. And when most cam timing issues, if the valves don't close properly, I'll lose volume from the cylinder. And therefore I would call that a leak. Volume changes in the cylinder are what we're really looking at. Whenever you're looking at these pressure waveforms, be very aware that this is not the pressure that we're really looking at. These are volume changes that we're looking at. Volume has to change and pressure follows the volume changes. Start to think about all this as volume. It's always about volume changes. When a volume changes from a large or small, either way, the pressure will follow a volume change. So basically, if I have I and this goes up too high, I have some type of a cam or cam timing or a leak issue. If D is any lower than I, if D came down and it's lower than I, the cylinder is leaking. 
When I come up on compression, I had this state of volume, whatever I close that valve, that is how much volume I have in the cylinder. I close the valve. If I come up on compression and some of the volume leaked out and then the piston returned to the same position within the cylinder as when I close this valve and I have more negative pressure on the exhaust pocket, that means that some of the volume was forced out and leaked. D always has to be equal to the intake pull or slightly higher. As soon as D is lower than the intake pull, it's an indication that I had leakage within the cylinder. As I come across, J is just basically the average of the pull. K now comes up to where I'm going to close the valve. This is the intake closure. If I draw a line, we'll say, down this ramp, and I come across, I'm going to have an intersection point where I can see where this was flat and this started to go up. The reason for this is, is this is going to happen where the intake valve is closing, the expected is basically 40 to 60 degrees after bottom dead center. So I'm 60 degrees over, the piston has already had a lot of movement. But notice that the piston, even though it's going up, that is stays down. The reason that that pressure stays down is the induction system is an accumulator. That intake manifold has a large amount of volume. And with this large amount of volume within that cylinder, this now, um, this volume will hold that pressure down from the storage area or the negative pressure that's stored in this intake manifold. Most intake manifolds will have about three liters of volume with them. In a high performance engine you can have a liter per per liter of cylinder, but that makes the airflow go slower, and so it makes it run very well up high, but it doesn't run that well down low. So most cars want the velocity of the air to be kept at a high rate, so we keep the induction systems a little bit smaller, and that means the velocity of air can be at a higher rate, so we produce torque at a lower point. That would be like what most of the production model vehicles would do. Now that the this is held down and this is held as soon as the valve closes now and the pistons already upward moving I create this to start coming up then I start to come to L and L is going to be at the 90 degree point now L H E and C will all be in a real close pressure relation to where if we came across a line we could see something very interesting on a lot of cars these will happen at about the same time in degrees. When we have any kind of change within the cylinder such as leakage, these points will start to change. Not all cylinders have perfect relation, but there's always a relationship between these points within the waveform. And when these points change, it's something that I'm interested in looking at. Now that we've got this, we start to come up on our compression again to where we come to M, which is half mast with B, and again, half mass from the center point out, and from the center point out, they need to be less than 20 degrees of each other. If we get them longer, and you don't really need to measure this, you can see it with your eye, the tower will look in such a fashion that it's leaning. And with these leaning towers, it's a mechanical problem. Them. and then I come back to A and A is going to be my top dead center position. So now is what we want to do is we want to get a waveform and we want to get an idle with a snap. So let's go ahead and do that. So what we want to do is we want to set our scope up. I've taken the scope and I've set it up to 25 inches of water. This is my tailpipe sensor. 500, this is my ignition. 300, this is my in-cylinder pressure. And the blue will be the minus 30 HG, this is the negative pressure within the induction system. So basically, if we just start to get this capture, this is the cranking stage, and as we see, we come down, and this is the idle stage of the motor. 
That's my snap. Now basically is what we have is we have the we have the crank and then it comes down as the engine is started and the throttle is closed and we pull a higher vacuum level and we can shut this off we can shut this off and we can see our actual vacuum here came up and when we snap the throttle that vacuum decreased and then it went up high again during the decel mode notice that it's much higher during decel than during the idle position now when I snap it and we come up here we really want somewhere about three times the snap pressure now when we look at this we basically have 47 pounds of pressure at idle we snapped it and within three or four cycles we want it to go up and it went to 162 pounds now the three times is relative guys if the engine is barely running the throttle control is trying to target an idle and it's going to let more air into the engine the more air that goes into the engine that means I have more volume the more volume when I bring the large volume into a small space containment during the compression I will have more pressure now normally what you're going to see at idle is somewhere about 40 to 70 psi those are real normal numbers at an idle if the car has some type of a drivability problem and the computer is targeting that system to let more air in to try to hit its target then these are going to be higher now so if these are a little higher I'm okay with that now if your idle is up over a hundred psi a hundred and twenty or thirty pounds at idle where did the air come from if I have really high pressures during a volume state I have to have a lot of volume in there to make 120 or 150 pounds during idle the throttle plate should be closed the first question that I want you to start to ask now where did the extra air come from is the idle open so I could take a scan tool and I could look at my throttle plate position and I could see if it's open a lot trying to command that or is my cam out of time and it's allowing the air to come back in through the exhaust such as an EGR stage also making the engine run very bad with high levels of pressure pressure I can also have some type of a plug that might come out of an intake and now I have an inrush of air and now I would have high pressure it really doesn't matter what the state would be as soon as I see really high idle pressures there's a problem that's what it's indicating to me so now I need to look at other things to correlate that problem with now if I have really high pressure I'm not going to get three times my state change if I have a normal pressure and the engines running fairly normally and I snap it I want more than three times my pressure that just says that I had a lot of pressure in rush into the cylinder when I snapped it open and this is very normal the next thing I want to look at very carefully is where I let off the engine is now revving higher maybe 3000 rpm and I slam the throttle plate closed that will allow more vacuum to enter and I can see leakage right in here I can also see deficiencies such as a cam or a rocker arm that's worn out not opening the valve then I'm going to want to look over here after the rev always snap the throttle during your test always have 40 to 50 seconds of time selected on your scope so you can have enough data to go back and start to look at different points when you check cam timing check it in several different positions one of the most important things is after I've put mechanical energy into the motor I snap the throttle and the engine revs up well that increases my oil pressure the viscometric that increases the load on my valve springs my opening mechanisms for my valve a lot of things go under load 
from these type of, of kinetic energy when I rev the engine. So sometimes you'll see where I rev the motor and I won't recover my pressure from here. It will actually drop and it won't come back up. That would maybe indicate a valve spring is bad. I've also seen this where lifters pump up from the additional oil pressure and the lifter now is keeping the valve or one of the valves off of its seat. So always snap the throttle. Now what we want to do is we want to come in, we're going to take our zoom window and we're going to take a section to look at. So here's my section. I want to get my cursors and I want to come in and I want to measure from peak to peak. Now all we got to do is we're going to just mark cam. If I want to take my zoom window to get a better window on this, I can do that. Now I've got my waveform. If I get my cursor and I take this cursor and I put it on this position, take this cursor and I'm going to move it right about here. If you look at this, do you see how this is dropping down and I come in and right about here I have an actual change in that. So that, in, that exhaust valve is opening roughly, we look up here, it's 31 degrees. The difference between these cursors once you mark this is given in the crank degrees. So this cam timing on this engine should be okay. Now if I came over here and we measure this out and we come to this peak where we started to drop the pressure. So we come right in here and we can see that right about there before that top dead center position, we open just right about that. That's about five degrees. That's showing where the intake valve opened on this engine. Now, I'm going to open the valve and I want this whole ramp to complete its movement within 60 degrees. This is 30, 60. If this ramp comes way over into here, it's too long. If this whole ramp is really rounded, it's telling me the valves aren't opening correctly. If the is all rounded with a high pressure spike in the middle, it's telling me the exhaust valve didn't open. Any time that I have a scavenge problem, I'm going to build pressure at the very end right here at the 360 point. The piston is moving from bottom dead center to top dead center. Any volume did, that did not get out of the cylinder where the valve is open, now will start to build pressure. If I have real high pressures at the end right here, this is an indication that I have some type of a scavenge issue. I'm not able to get the exhaust into into the tailpipe and out into the atmosphere. So any type of real high pressure right at the 360 point from here is indicative that I have some type of a problem. Now that I come over and I come over here, I want to see where this valve closed. So in order to do that, I'm going to take this marker and I'm going to take this mark and I'm going to come over and roughly I see where this came down and where this came across and I can see that right before the 60 it started to have a rise at about 57 degrees. This would be indicative that this cam is in time. So I've checked this valve opening and that valve opening is within my target. Basically a rule of thumb, it's not for every motor but it's a good portion of motors, is going to be 30 to 50 degrees. Now some engines will be over at 60 degrees and that's normal you got to be aware of that. But this ramp is another indication of where it should be. I want it to cross the bottom dead center mark somewhere towards the half to the set this top point. So if I had the pink marker and it was up into this edge here from the bottom here to here that shows that the ramp is good. Remember that this ramp is in rushing air from the exhaust filling this cylinder. This is actually pressure moving back into the cylinder from the exhaust. So how fast this ramp happens has to do with when the valve opened and how far the valve opened to allow that pressure to happen. So that would indicate that that was good. Now on this side, if I looked about halfway up the ramp, 
I'm looking about my 20 degree mark. This engine does not have VVT, so I'm okay right here. This would be an okay position. So by looking at where my valve basically opened and looking at where my ramp is, I'm going to be good. Then I'm going to come across and I'm going to look at where this valve. By looking at all the different positions, I got a good idea if the cam timing is correct. Additionally, I want to check my peak pressure. My peak pressure is going to be roughly about 48, to 8, 48 pounds of pressure. That again is within something I'm in expectation. If I wanted to look at my peak pressure, and now I wanted to look at this guy right here, I would look at the difference, and I have 14 degrees. This little red line is my spark, so I can actually check the ignition position against the top dead center position, and now I have a way to check ignition timing in this as well. So all of these are very relative. When I want to take, and we want to look at this induction pull, these are my poles. So each one of these is the pull from the induction. Now when we start to look at this, we can get our cursors and we can come over here and we can see that right in here where we have a peak and a drop is where the valve opened. Somewhere right after that, we opened here. So the valve, this is an indication, again, I want to have another position to check my cam timing. Well, I can check the cam timing by watching these. This is my drop. Now, when I'm looking for a valve leaking, I'm looking at the transitional point. This is one valve pulling air. This is a pull. And now the valve opened. And when the valve opened, I drop vacuum. This is more vacuum. This is less vacuum. As soon as the valve opens, I lose air. I lose pressure because I lost volume. Volume goes from in the intake to in the cylinder. This is the drop. Now I start to pull the next cylinder. This transitional point is really important. I'm looking for these to be the same. On a good motor, these are relatively close. When one of these drops way down, and not even that far, but a little bit down, that's an indication that I have a leak somehow in that system. So these are really good positions. One, I can tell when the valve opened and and I can see that I dropped, and I can see if I drop too much, and then I'm going to build the vacuum up. I want to make sure that these pulls from this side to this side are all about the same, and the overall functions look similar as well. Now when we go back out and we go down, we want to look at the exhaust real quick as well. So if we zoom in on this exhaust, we can see that if we get the cursor and we put the cursor down at the bottom of where the valve opened down here and then we start to look at where we had a change this is my state change so I open the valve here and I get this pocket in other words this is negative pressure right when I open the valve now I have an inrush the air is rushing in from the exhaust system and that puts this exhaust into a negative state of pressure. This exhaust drop is indicative of that this pocket being made. That pocket is the is the negative pressure that's pulling in the exhaust and I can see that from when I opened it to where I started to drop this. Do you see how this pocket is just like this pocket? But there's latency because as I opened this pocket and the air rushed in it took time to change the volume within that exhaust system. But once again I can start to look at this exhaust where it changed and I can check to see if my exhaust valve opened at the right time or it didn't open at the right time. Then we need to go out really quickly and we want to look at this inrush. So we're going to come up and we're going to look at this inrush and we can see that we got additional pressure and the other thing we want to see is right here where we where we pulled this pressure. Notice that we dropped vacuum here
and this is the drop in vacuum this pocket right here is made by vacuum now as we move across here we don't have as much vacuum so we won't have that exhaust pocket if you snap the throttle and you have a big waveform that looks similar to this but it's during a snap phase over here it's indicative that the exhaust is restricted when we come back out we want to come in and we want to look at the exhaust this is D cell notice where I zoomed in I let off the throttle and I went into a heavy D cell now when you look at the towers always make sure that the compression tower is larger than the exhaust if this tower is really equal or lower you didn't let enough air in you might have a worn cam or a rocker that's worn the valve is an opening and I don't have air in there this is higher because the air is coming in through the exhaust side than what can come in through the intake these towers should always be higher than the exhaust plateau on some engines these will be just slightly higher on other engines they might be 20 pounds higher depends on the cam timing so this is a quick overview of these systems. We sure appreciate your time here and now I'm ready to take uh, questions from you. Thank you so much for your time this evening.